Hello and uh, welcome to the Department of East Asian Studies at Tel Aviv University online forum. I am Ori Sella, the chair of the department, and I'm delighted and honored to have with us today General McMaster, whom I will introduce in a minute. I would also like to acknowledge the presence here of the rector of our university, Professor Mark Steif, along with several distinguished guests and friends from the US and Canada. Thank you all for coming. I will now introduce the general. Uh, it's going to be a very brief intro introduction, otherwise we can spend the entire half an hour and much longer uh, just with that. And then we shall proceed uh, to the general's talk. If our Zoom guests have specific questions, please write them in the chat. It's only for me, only for the host. And if time permits, uh, we will try to engage a couple of these questions. So, um, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster is currently a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and also teaches at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. General McMaster was appointed the National Security Advisor by United States President Donald Trump in 2017 and served um, as such for over a year, a very important year, I may add. Prior to his appointment as National Security Advisor, he assumed various duties in the US Army, where he served as an officer since 1984. During those years, he served both in various war the theaters, some closer to where I am sitting right now than to his uh, home in the US, including Iraq and Afghanistan. General McMaster also holds a PhD in military history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and he is the author of the award-winning book, uh, The Reliction of Duty, which deals with the Vietnam War and decision-making uh, that encompasses it. Recently, his book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World, was published and received many positive reviews. In fact, it also sparked significant debate on how strategy should be thought of, uh, a rethinking, perhaps, that we here in Israel can also benefit from. Lastly, I should note that as National Security Advisor for President Trump, General McMaster was in office during critical moments in shaping the US strategy towards Asia as a whole and China in particular. The strategy he devised and his team devised and the knowledge base that they were in charge of are highly influential today as well to my mind. General, I am grateful that you accepted my invitation to talk with us today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it, Professor Sella, for the opportunity to be with all of you. And, and Professor Stey, thank you for your hospitality and, and the ability to, 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 to meet with your students and, and the audience you've assembled here. What I'd like to do is maybe talk thank about you. the theme, thank you. the theme that I think is important uh, to competing effectively uh, with the, the Chinese Communist Party in particular. General, and I you think, need to unmute again. Yeah. Yep, I got it. Okay. So the theme is that how we can maybe turn what authoritarians view as our weaknesses into the free world's competitive advantages. And you know, I believe that the defining competition of the 21st century uh, has been and will continue to be one between closed authoritarian systems and free and open societies. And, and at the moment, Free and open societies appear to be in a position of disadvantage, right? Because uh, the United States, European countries, Japan, Australia, Israel, and others were for much of the past two decades, I believe, absent from critical arenas of competition. And that absence was due to what we might call strategic narcissism. This is what I write about in Battlegrounds and, and in particular, the American tendency to, since the end of the Cold War in particular, to define problems as we might like them to be and indulge in the conceit that others really have no aspirations or agency of their own, right? It's just They, they just respond to, to our actions and our decisions. Uh, strategic narcissism, I think, led some to believe that it, an arc of history had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems that the expansion of liberal democracy was, was inevitable. Some also assumed that old features of geopolitics and international relations had become passe, right? Global governance in the post-Cold War period was, was the, 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 the term of the day, right? A great power condominium would emerge that would displace great power competition. 
And a corollary to those assumptions was that China, having been welcomed into the international order, would play by the rules, and as it prospered, would liberalize its economy and its form of governance. Overcoming this self-referential view of the world requires an emphasis on what the historian Zachary Shore calls strategic empathy. Strategic empathy attends to the ideology, aspirations, and emotions that drive and constrain competitors. Empathy fosters a degree of competence in strategy because understanding the other exposes unrealistic, often implicit assumptions that underpin policies. It also reveals dangerous cognitive traps, such as optimism bias and confirmation bias. So these assumptions about the post-Cold War world turned out to be false. Uh, in this century, a, a new great power competition has emerged. The actions of the Chinese Communist Party, actions driven by uh, what I believe is a combination of fear and ambition, have revealed to the world that it is the greatest threat to achieving a positive vision for the future, a positive vision uh, that would include sustainable and equitable growth, peaceful and thriving societies, and accountable and inclusive governance. The Chinese Communist Party leadership continues to speak the language of cooperation and global governance while conducting one of the greatest peacetime military buildups in history. I mean, 800% increase in defense spending since 1995 suppressing freedom at home, exporting an authoritarian mercantilist model, and subverting uh, international organizations, you know, like the World Health Organization, but many others as well. Chairman Xi Jinping pledges, you know, the, the, Xi Jinping, the environmentalist, you know, he pledges carbon neutrality by 2060, while his country builds 50 to 70 coal-fired plants globally per year. He gives speeches on free trade you know, at, at, at Davos, while engaging in economic aggression and unfair trade and economic practices and, and a sustained campaign of industrial espionage. He boasts of the superiority of the Chinese Communist Party system while he interns millions of people in concentration camps and wages a campaign of cultural genocide against the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. He speaks of a community of common destiny as the People's Liberation Army bludgeons Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier and engages in, if they succeed, what would be the largest land grab in history, so to speak, in the South China Sea. The party is intensifying its efforts. I think COVID-19 has catalyzed the party's efforts to extend and tighten its grip on power internally and to gain preponderant power in pursuit of national rejuvenation externally through a campaign of what I believe is, and what I describe in, in Battlegrounds, a campaign of co-option, coercion, and concealment. China co-ops countries, international corporations, and elites through false promises of impending liberalization, insincere pledges to work on global issues such as climate change, and especially the lure of short-term profits, profits that come from access to the Chinese market, or Chinese investments and loans. Co-option includes debt traps set for corrupt or weak governments. And there's a new study just out last week about what some of the terms of these loans are, uh, which, uh, which include oftentimes the, the Ch China's ability to recall the debt immediately if, if that government criticizes uh, Chinese Communist Party policies and actions. So this co-option makes countries and corporations dependent and vulnerable to coercion. The party coerces others to support its efforts to extinguish human rights uh, and human freedom internally, as it did in the case, the famous case of the National Basketball Association, the more recent cases of, of H&M and Adidas and Nike. And it applies coercive power to reshape the international order to favor its authoritarian mercantilist model. And, uh, examples include, of course, the, the World Health Organization, but also the Human Rights Council, UNESCO, even the International Civil Aviation Organization. That's just naming a few of the organizations that China joins so it can turn those organizations actually against their very purpose. So while there are still some who advocate 
for accommodation and appeasement of the Chinese Communist Party, I think it's now painfully clear. Uh, maybe uh, Chancellor Merkel didn't get the word on this, but I think most people have that the free world must return uh, to arenas of competition uh, vacated based on the forlorn hope that the Chinese Communist Party would see the light uh, and change its ways. If we fail to build coalitions across the free world to compete effectively, uh, I, I think that, that the world uh, will be less free, less prosperous, and less safe. So what does that competition entail? I, I think, first of all, we have to correct really two fundamental misunderstandings concerning the nature of the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. And then I think we have to think creatively about how the free world can compete by turning what the party views as our weaknesses into our greatest competitive advantages. So first, these two misunderstandings. These two misunderstandings are dangerous because the party uses them as cover for its campaign of co-option, coercion, and concealment, the concealment part of that campaign. It uses these misunderstandings to get away with, with various forms of aggression internally as it perfects its Orwellian surveillance state uh, and, and also to get away with aggression externally as it pursues primacy through programs such as military civil fusion, uh, Made in China 2025, and One Belt, One Road. So this, the first misunderstanding is that Chinese aggression is, is the result of U.S.-China tensions, right, and just difficulties in the relationship, uh, mainly a reaction to the Donald Trump administration's description of China as a rival. And this misunderstanding is a form of strategic narcissism. It's actually an arrogant, self-referential view because it, it's based on, again, this assumption that the party has no aspirations of its own and no volition except in reaction to the United States. But even the most cursory survey of, of recent Chinese Communist Party actions should correct this misunderstanding. You know, consider the party's deliberate suppression of, of the COVID-19 outbreak, the, the persecution of doctors and journalists who are trying to ring the alarm bells uh, about it um, and to warn the world, the, the subversion of the World Health Organization. Consider you know, the insult to injury with, with the party's global wolf warrior diplomacy attempting not only to obscure China's responsibility for foisting the pandemic on the world, but also to portray its response and its authoritarian system as superior and the free world's response and democratic systems of government as inferior. Consider the, the massive global cyber attacks right, on medical research facilities in the midst of a pandemic and the punitive cyber attacks on an economic coercion of Australia, you know, under the, really this effort to kill one to scare a hundred because Australia had the temerity to suggest an inquiry into the origins of the virus. Consider the expulsion of, of, of international reporters, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the head of uh, BBC, uh, the BBC office fled in the middle of the night uh, just last week, uh, and the party's unabashed announcement that it will continue to use hostage taking, such as the jailing of Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig now for over two years, uh, as well as the roundup of the so-called you know, Taiwanese spies and, and, and others who, who were activists for freedom in, in Hong Kong, the recent you know, conviction um, or forced admissions of guilt uh, that occurred just yesterday. All of this in an effort really to, to coerce others to accommodate its various forms of aggression. Consider physical aggression, as I mentioned, on the India's Himalayan frontier in the South China Sea, where, where the party has given orders to the Chinese Coast Guard to fire on vessels that don't acknowledge that China owns the, that part of the ocean, right? Hey, hey we, nobody owns the ocean, right? Consider the, the long sentences given to peaceful protesters and critics. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping boasts of his intention to expand concentration camps in Xinjiang as he races to protect, perfect, perfect this Orwellian surveillance state and, and build this great firewall uh, even higher. Consider the brazen hypocrisy of Xi Jinping posing as an environmentalist while he destroys ecosystems in the South China Sea uh, and continues to increase carbon emissions uh, and build coal-fired plants. So, I mean, I could go on about this, obviously, but all this is just to make the point. We, we have to acknowledge that the Chinese Communist Party aggression it's not a U.S. problem. This is a whole world problem, and it's especially a free world problem. 
And it's important to correct this misunderstanding because its corollary among nations in Europe and across the Indo-Pacific region is that, hey, the United States is is asking these countries to choose, right? We're asking Israel to choose, you know, when you when you consider turning over port facilities or communications infrastructure uh, to uh, uh, to China, it, they we're asking you to choose between Washington and Beijing. But, you know, if there's a choice to be made, I think it's a choice forced upon these countries, other countries, by Xi Jinping and his party. And it's not a choice between Washington and Beijing. It's really a choice between sovereignty and servitude. The, se the second misunderstanding is that a competition with China is dangerous, right? It's even, it's irresponsible because of this Thucydides trap that presents us with a binary choice between passivity and a destructive war. I think this is a false dilemma, and I would argue that passivity in connection with the Chinese Communist Party aggression in the South China Sea and elsewhere had actually put us on a path to conflict. I think had the United States remained complacent under the strategy of cooperation and engagement, uh, the strategy that some people still advocate for, especially on, on Wall Street here in the U.S., uh, China would likely have become even more aggressive. Transparent competition, though, can prevent unnecessary escalation and enable rather than shut down cooperation with China. The party promotes that false dilemma associated with, with the Thucydides trap to portray efforts to defend against its aggression as simply the status quo power, you know, the United States trying to keep the rising power of China and its people down. Calls to cooperate with China without a reference to the need to defend against the party's increasing aggression reinforce that narrative. So again, it's important to correct these misunderstandings because they provide cover for the party's aggression and a rationalization for those who are eager to, to, sh to shrink from competition in pursuit of short-term profits. International cooperation uh, to defend against the party's aggression uh, is growing, but there's a lot more to be done, right? The quad format, as you've seen, is invigorated of, of India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. Uh, the, the recent ministerial meeting in Tokyo, President Biden's virtual meeting with quad leaders, Prime Minister Suga's impending visit to the United States, all of that's positive. Uh, law enforcement and intelligence cooperation against Chinese cyber warfare and, and you know the, this organization of assistant, uh, Advanced Persistent Threat 10 and others uh, and the, the broad efforts at, at cyber and industrial espionage is growing. Um, you know, there are more sanctions uh, against the party's main hacking organization and entities associated with it. Economic cooperation is, is growing uh, in, in connection with standards for infrastructure investment, uh, you know, countering the, the CCP's sort of concessional finance efforts or uh, bringing complaints uh, on Chinese economic aggression to the World Trade Organization. Democratic countries are working together to prevent China from subverting more international organizations, uh, turning it against their purpose, capturing authorship uh, over, over data standards or internet privacy standards, for example. So there's a lot of cooperation ongoing, but there's a lot more to be done. Uh, and I think correcting these, these misunderstandings is really the first step in, in, in doing so. So what more can we do? I think the overall concept is, is that we ought to adopt is that, is that we have to generate confidence in the principles that distinguish our free and open societies from China's closed authoritarian system. We do have competitive advantages in what we regard as unalienable or universal rights, you know, freedom of expression, of assembly, and of the press, freedom of religion, and freedom from persecution based on religion, race, gender, or sexual orientation. You know, we have the freedom to prosper in our free market economic system. You know, we have rule of law and the protections that the rule of law affords to life and, and liberty. And democratic governance that recognizes that government serves the people rather than the other way around. The, the Chinese Communist Party views these as weaknesses. Freedom of expression, for example, they see it as a weakness to be suppressed at home and to be exploited abroad. The free exchange of information ideas, however, it might be our greatest competitive advantage in our societies. People who, who direct, I think, academic exchanges or who are responsible for Chinese student experiences should ensure that those students enjoy the same freedom of thought and expression as other students. In the United States, I don't know if this is true in Israel, there's this practice now of, of the Chinese Students and Scholars Association, essentially a front for, for uh, Ministry of State security efforts to, to keep tabs on Chinese students and to, 
to, to make sure that they don't have an opportunity to express their, their views and, and to experience really uh, the academic freedom that's so important uh, to, to undergraduate and graduate experiences. So, so I, I think we all have a role to play uh, in, 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 in welcoming uh, more Chinese individuals and entities uh, who, who are not acting as, as, as extensions or arms of the Chinese Communist Party. And, and I think it, we also promoting good governance internationally is immensely important because gov governments that are responsive to the people that, that, are, that, are, that are protected uh, from, from, uh, from corruption and the party's efforts to, to, to arrive uh, with a, a Chinese Communist Party official accompanied by a Chinese National Bank official with a, a duffel bag full of cash, I think is, is, is the best way to defend uh, against this kind of pernicious form of, 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 uh, of co-option and, and coercion. Uh, but I think most importantly, we have to get a backbone. You know, I think our companies and our countries have to stand together to resist the course of power of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think you know, the attacks on H&M and Adidas and Nike in just recent uh, days and, and weeks are just the latest examples of how the party demands the companies compromise their values. I think that this very cordial phone call you know, and, and the readout of it between Chancellor Merkel and uh, Xi Jinping just a couple of days ago is another example of this divide and conquer approach. The fact that Japan has been relatively mute, you know, on on human rights abuses, egregious human rights abuses in in Xinjiang, for example, is another example of this divide and conquer, right? So, so this really gives China license to crack down on U.S. businesses, for example, uh, and then shift market share uh, to those countries and companies that remain compliant uh, and continue to kowtow uh, to the Chinese Communist Party. So, the, I think we ought to also strengthen our our, our, our uh, advocacy for, for tolerance of, of diversity. China sees this as maybe its, its, greatest, its greatest threat. Uh, I think for America, what we could do in particular, I think other countries as well, uh, is to open our doors uh, to those uh, who experience the course of power of the party and who, who are fleeing uh, that coercion. Uh, you know, after the Tiananmen Square massacre, George H.W. Bush said, hey, if you're a Chinese student studying in the United States, you, you, get a, you get a green card, you know, you get an H-1B visa. And 58,000 students took them up on that. And th those are some of our most successful, productive uh, citizens uh, today. So, so I think that, that it's important for us to, to accentuate our strengths and to use these strengths in, in our competition with China and, and especially to counter China's promotion of its authoritarian mercantile system, right? <laughs> I mean, look at the places where China succeeded, right, in, in creating these client states. It was Zimbabwe, Cambodia, Laos. I mean, it's not a pretty picture, right? And so, so I think it, it's time for us to advocate uh, for the alternative, uh, which is representative government, rule of law, freedom of expression, and, and, and the values that we hold dear. And this is not just really an exercise in altruism. I, I really believe it is the best way to compete effectively uh, with China's uh, China's authoritarian, centralized, statist uh, model. And of course, there's a business dimension to this. Uh, I think that, you know, our, our, you know, our, you know, the Israel's a great example of, you know, startup economy where, you know, where there is, is this de strength and decentralization and an unimpeded, unencumbered entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, the, the, the creativeness of, of, uh, the, of Isra Israel businesses U.S. businesses, free world businesses, I think have to be galvanized to our advantage. This is where I think you know, we, need our, we need Wall Street and investors to get the word here, right? I think they're the outliers in this competition because in many ways they continue to underwrite our own demise uh, by investing in China in ways that allows China to continue to prioritize business decisions based on how to gain strategic advantage rather than how to maximize returns on investment. And we are underwriting uh, their ability to do so with the massive uh, inflows of, of cash and investment as China became this year, the, the, it displaced the United States as the, as the largest, de uh, largest um, destination for, for foreign investment. So, so I, I think we have to do a better job uh, of, of informing uh, the private sector and institutions. I mean, I think it's unconscionable, for example, <laughs> that, uh, that U.S. venture capital firms and private equity firms uh, invested more in Chinese artificial intelligence companies than they did in American ones uh, over the past couple of years. 
So I, I think we have to we have we have work to do uh, in in academia and in, in the public sector to work with the private sector and help uh, private sector understand better uh, that that uh, that that China that this is China is competing in a way that's unfair because we're allowing them to use our free market economic system against us uh, while they don't adhere to the rules and don't make good on the promises that they made in 2001 upon entry to the World Trade Organization. By the way, this, these are the same promises <laughs> that they've made uh, to, to get um, you know, certain countries in Europe to advocate for this comprehensive agreement on investment in Europe as well. So, so I think also we have to, we have to defend to, to make sure that China can't use the open nature of our of our societies uh, and economies to promote its status capitalist model uh, and, and, and perfect its, its police state. I think for doing business in China, you know, there should be almost a Hippocratic oath, right, of, of first doing no harm. Hey, don't help China gain an unfair differential advantage over our companies uh, in the emerging data-driven global economy, or don't help the People's Liberation Army gain a differential advantage uh, over our, our military forces. The second would be, hey, don't help them. You know, don't help them create this, this Orwellian, technologically enabled police state. And finally, don't compromise the long-term viability of our companies and our, our workers' jobs uh, based on the lure of short-term profits in, in China. And there are many examples of that we could talk about if, if, if you'd like. Chinese companies that list on our exchanges, right? <laughs> hey, how about just meeting the, 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 the uh, reporting requirements uh, and, and the transparency requirements associated with listing on those on those exchanges. So in the area of investment, you know, I'm reminded of the quotation that's probably wrongly attributed to Lenin, but it's too good to pass up, which is, is that the, you know, the, the, the capitalists will sell, sell us the rope with which we will hang them. Well, we're, we're not only, we're not selling them the rope, we're actually, you know, we're actually financing their purchase of the rope so they can, so they can, uh, so they can hang us. So, you know, I, I think defensive measures are important. But of course, we need to also invest, right, and, and strengthen our, our, our own economies and strengthen our, our own democratic uh, systems of, of government. You know, we have a lot of work to do here in the U.S., and I'm sure all of you saw and, 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 and watched, uh, you know, with, with trepidation, you know, this assault on the Capitol on January 6th. We have a lot of work to do to kind of restore our confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. But I do believe that we, are, we, are, we have the advantage in this, in this competition. You know, I, I think that that the party sees this exclusive and permanent grip on power uh, as as a strength relative to pluralistic democratic systems. But there's there's growing evidence, however, that you know citizens' participation in democratic processes and in countries targeted by the by the party ha have been what's most effective in countering predatory policies under one belt one road, uh, for for example. And and also, I think what's important is that you know. You know <laughs> That, uh, that I think China recognizes that ultimately the greatest danger to the party is that the Chinese people will want to have a say in how they're governed. They would have us believe that the Chinese people are culturally predisposed toward not wanting a say in how they're governed. And of course, uh, what, gives, what, what exposes that lie is the great success of Taiwan, uh, which is one of the reasons why China's uh, obsessed uh, with, with uh with gaining control of, of Taiwan, and I think by force if necessary. We can talk more about that if you'd like. So to, just to, to make this point on the strength of our democratic societies, I just I would use the example of Wang An, who, who migrated to the United States from China in the 1950s. He founded the, you know, the groundbreaking computer company, Wang Laboratories. Uh, of his adopted country, the United States, you know, he observed as a nation, we do not always live up to our ideals, ideals right? And uh, of course we don't. Our, our founders recognized that you know, our republic would take you know, continuous nurturing. But what Wang An said is that what we have structures that allow us to correct our wrongs by means short of revolution. And I think this is why support for democratic institutions and processes and the unalienable rights that should be afforded to all peoples, it, it is, again, not just an exercise in altruism. Uh, it's also the best way to compete. Protection of those rights promotion of democratic governance. It's a practical means of competing effectively with the Chinese Communist Party and, and building a better world for future generations of Americans and Israelis. So, hey, thanks for the opportunity to be with all of you. And I hope that's enough to get us started uh, in the conversation. Thank you very, very much, General McMaster. Um, maybe I'll um, 
take just one question from the from the chat and uh, and pose it because it, it brings I think several things uh, together. That question is by uh, Greg and he's asking basically. Um, I'm rephrasing it, it's in Hebrew. Um, what kind of um, steps uh, are uh, possible for the US when the US competes uh, against um, China's, um, China's presence, I would say, in Africa? So uh, assuming that uh, economic sanctions on China are less effective, that's his assumption, um, are less effective than against other uh, countries. Th there's a big question of how effective they are in general, but I'll leave that aside. Um, what concrete steps can the U.S. do vis-a-vis uh, -vis African countries? Yeah. Okay, a, a good deal of this is underway, and I just don't, I'm not in a position to, under, to understand how effective it's been, but there was this this blue dot initiative, right, which is to work together with like-minded partners, Japan, obviously, who has a you know, who has a tremendous amount of investment across the Indo-Pacific region and into Africa as well, but to provide alternatives to Chinese financed and Chinese uh, constructed uh, you know, infrastructure projects across the continent. Because in recognition that, that, these, that these projects, the you know, Chinese uh, funded projects come with strings attached. And, and, um, and to take advantage, I think, would, of what is already uh, I think more than a nascent um, backlash against Chinese influence on the continent. You know, there's a there, there's a an, an investigative journalist in Kenya, for example, uh, wrote about the the Chinese finance projects in in that country, in particular the you know, coal fired plant that was just completed. That is the largest carbon emitter in Kenya, and it's right next to like a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and. Uh, and he called these arrangements, you know, a new form of colonialism, which is obviously strong language and, and evokes strong emotion. The Nigerian legislature uh, passed a resolution against additional Chinese investment. I mean, across the continent, I think that there is a great deal of wariness. But the question is, hey, what's the alternative, right? I mean, uh, the, Africa does have a crying need for infrastructure. Uh, China, China provides a, a good deal of that. But I think there's a recognition now that that does come as a cost of, of sovereignty. Yeah, and I think one of the, it's almost a comical example, is that China donated the the African uh, Union's headquarters building, <laughs> and, and of course they found out that the whole thing was wired to immediately exfiltrate every conversation, every bit of data, you know, back to Beijing. So, so I, I think that uh, I think that the, we we can take advantage of that. We being the free world can take advantage of that, but we have to provide all alternatives. And and I think ultimately it, it, this is this is an area where the promotion of good governance again, it's not just altruistic. It's the best way to inoculate countries, uh, you know, a, against this kind of you know, pernicious form of economic and, and financial aggression. Thank you. Um, I, I before we switch to the closed meeting with the students. Uh, just one last question that may interest uh, a lot of the public here in, in Israel, um, coming from uh, actually uh, someone else, um, which is uh, regarding the latest uh, agreement between China and Iran, of course, yeah. and uh, your take on how that agreement may uh, change the balance of power in the Middle East, in the, in the region. Well, I think the biggest change is that that Iran is not as isolated as it was in 2016, right, or 2014, and when it when it when it first you know made known that it wanted to engage in, in negotiations that resulted uh, in the Iran nuclear deal, a deal that I think was a a political disaster masquerading as a diplomatic triumph, right, and but but what made Iran want to negotiate was the economic pressure it was under the and how isolated it was. China's now buying, you know, 1 million barrels of oil a day from, from Iran. I, I think one of the reasons why the Iran nuclear deal is dead and not coming back, right, is, is first of all, Iran's violating it to begin with, right, <laughs> or already. Um, some of the sunset clauses are already about to kick in anyway. I mean, the deal's already almost dead, right, but just because of that. And then also, I think uh, Iranian leaders now don't feel like they really need it anymore to get sanctions relief as much as they did before. And I think because of the perception that the Biden administration might be weak on Iran, 
other countries are also uh, loosening their adherence to sanctions on Iran. I mean, India's uh, at least having conversations about buying uh, oil from uh, from Iran as, as well. And some of the same characters, you know, are back in action from the Obama years uh, with the uh, with the Iranians, which I, I think is terrible. You know, I think that uh, I think that some of the initial you know, the, the initial comments by Secretary Blinken were quite positive during his testimony because what he did is he connected Iran's nuclear program to the missile program, and he also connected it uh, to the, any kind of a deal to Iran's four-decade-long-plus, you know, proxy war uh, against, you know, the great Satan, you know, no offense, the little Satan, Israel, <laughs> and, uh, and the Arab monarchies. So, so you know, I, I think that was positive. So I hope that that, that at least stays in place. But again, this is an area where, you know, the Europeans have to kind of step up again. You know, I mean, I, I really am all for better relations with our European allies, but it has to be better. It has to be more than a better atmosphere at cocktail parties in Paris, right? It has to be a better relationship to do something, to do something about the, 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 the problem set associated with uh, China's Communist Party aggression and to do something in this case on Iran. And, and, you know, I think with the election coming up in Iran, you're obviously based on on, on uh, you know, on, uh, preventing anybody from running who, 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 uh, who could question the theocratic dictatorship there, uh, you're going to have a kind of a hardline parliament and you're going to have a hardline president. Not that the president matters any, anyway, right? But I think that's going to be a way to, to prevent, um, you know, anybody who's moderate to maybe succeed, succeed Hamene once he, once he dies, right? So I, I think that you're going to see a movement more to the right, um, and uh, more, you know, more toward the revolutionaries and away from the Republicans, and we're entering a very dangerous time as a result of that. And uh, and China, I think, I think Iran will step up its proxy wars in the region, and it will certainly do so if it has more resources available to it, uh, with associated with the relief of sanctions. Thank you very much, General McMaster. We will uh, now end this session, and uh, the students and specific invitees will turn on their second link and so so will you. So see you in five minutes. Yeah, thank, thank you, you uh, sure. audience. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, Professor Steif. Thank, thank, thanks everybody, shalom, take care.